Hi everyone, welcome to Distributed SQL Summit 2021. This is the third in our annual series of events that is bringing together the community, developers, architects, DBAs, DevOps, students, and pretty much anyone else who wants to learn about distributed SQL and building cloud native applications. We are delighted to have folks from around the world joining us today. So if you are joining this event live, welcome to the late nighters from Asia, to the post lunchers from Europe, and to the breakfast crowd from the west coast of the US and everyone else from around the world. Months of preparation have gone into putting this event together and a special thanks go to our growing community, to the speakers who have actually put in a lot of effort to get ready for the event, to our customers, to partners, to you by DB users, and to everyone who is here to learn. You're part of a very special group. We have an amazing array of sessions and workshops planned for you all and I hope you take the time to participate in as many of these events as you can. Let's kick things off with a keynote by Yugabai CTO and co-founder, Karthik Ranganathan. Karthik, over to you. Thank you, Sudhat. Um, I probably can't do better than what Sudha did in the intro, so I'll just stop with, uh, hey, welcome everybody to the third annual Distributed SQL Summit. Super excited to have everybody here. And like Sudha said, huge shout out to the community, the speakers, to everybody to make this happen. This is going to, this couldn't happen and couldn't be a success without you folks. So here we are at the Distributed SQL Summit to talk about unlocking the power of any, right? So it's going to be an interesting talk where we'll talk about, you know, real use cases that, uh, you know, Distributed SQL is helping, uh, what users are finding in their journey, along with interesting uh, talks and sessions that are going to happen over the next couple of days that will drill in on the various topics, right? So without much further ado, let's get started, right? Well, the first thing you're probably thinking is, what does any have to do with anything and any what? What, what does any mean? Well, we're going to be talking about five any's, right? Um, and these five any's are pretty critical to cloud native applications in general, right? And that's what we've seen. Um, any workload, any scale, any time, anywhere, and any cloud, right? So without wasting any more time, let's go right in. Okay, the first thing we're going to be talking about is any workload, right? So people moving their applications to the cloud, their workloads to the cloud, we're talking about user-facing transactional workloads, have a variety of different requests and needs from the data layer below, right? Now, if you look at how this typically happens, right? How does a typical cloud native uh, application get built and evolve over its lifetime? Well, it looks like this. This is of course an oversimplification, but phase one, you know, developers start to build an app and they just, you know, want to pick a framework that will suit them well for their application and a database they know really well. And they want to make sure both the app and the database have a strong feature set so it would carry them through the time that with the time period where the app needs to get traction, right? The first thing the app cares about or the developer cares about is, you know, their users really enjoy using their app and more users start using the app. In other words, the app gets traction, the app becomes successful. Well, pretty soon after it hits success, you need to start scaling things. And while you need, you still need to have transactions and relational integrity and all of those SQL features that are baked pretty deeply into the application, but you now also need to scale, right? At this point, the typical solution is let's introduce a NoSQL database, making the apps moderately scalable, you know, because it's like now sitting between SQL and NoSQL, but a lot more complex, right? And it makes it a little more frustrating for the developer. Now, the third stage is when it really starts taking off and you want to move it to different geographies and move data closer to users and a variety of other things, at which point you need to replicate data, add caches, make it really snappy to, in, in terms of how it reacts to users and so on. And the app is now super complex, making it really hard to build anything really, right? So all of this can really be simplified you know, if the cloud native applications start with a distributed SQL database because it both has SQL features and the and your RDBMS features that developers like, as well as being scalable and global, right? Now, many of you may be thinking, yeah, what if I'm not building a new app? What if I already have existing applications that I need to move to the cloud? Well, these applications are probably sitting on existing enterprise grade RDBMSs, like, you know, your Oracle, SQL servers, DB2s, et cetera, right? Now you first need to find a cloud native database to match the functionality of the existing enterprise grade DBs. 
And then, you know, that's needed because you need to port these apps and that requires the entire feature set. Then you need to migrate both the application and the database along with the data to a cloud native architecture using standard tools. And finally, shift everything else that's being built in the future to start looking cloud native and you know more like CI, CD and, and you know, all of the modern practices, right? Now, the third step is hard enough you know, by itself, it becomes really hard if you have to do this to a different set of APIs that you're not familiar with, right? So the, the simplest way to do this is to move to existing apps to distributed SQL where it retains the SQL semantics, but also gives you cloud native properties, right? So at, with Yucobyte DB as a database, for example, the way we've done it, we say we've kept the mantra, if your app is able to run on Postgres SQL, it can run on Yugabyte DB, right? And the rest of the stuff you have to do is really to unlock the power of the cloud native distributed substrate. Okay, the way we do this is, you know, one of the first decisions we had made when building the database is to say, we are not reinventing the API layer because there's enough databases out there. We don't need to be adding one more API. Um, so, uh, you know, the two the APIs we have today are the YSQL API, which is Postgres compatible, and the YCQL API, which is Apache Cassandra compatible, and it's a pluggable API layer. So, you know, vote for what you like next, right? You know, we'll start looking at it. Now, the question that often we have often asked ourselves and a lot of our users ask us is how Postgres SQL compatible is compatible? At what point is it really, you know, uh, can, can it substitute Postgres and really work seamlessly? Well, we've found out you pretty much have to have the entire feature set because what really matters is that it works with all of the application frameworks developers use like Spring, SQLize, Django, Ruby, like a, there's a ton of them. There's a, like schema migration frameworks like Flyway and Liquibase. There's a ton of developer tools. There's GraphQL, there's the schema tools such as DBVer, Table Plus, et cetera. There are your other really popular tools like Kafka, Presto, Spark. And finally, there's the whole migrations in the real world where you want to move your existing apps and you want to reuse the migration tools and frameworks and services and you know the folks that know how to migrate from one database to another, but from source databases like you know Postgres, MySQL, Oracle, et cetera, et cetera, right? And this requires the full range of features, right? Like even advanced complex features like triggers and stored procedures and you know, et cetera, et cetera. So here's an example of a user that started out in the cloud, but you know, really leveraged the power of distributed SQL to you know, make it really quick to build their application and increase developer velocity, right? So they were building their original application on Amazon services such as uh, RDS, Aurora, and DynamoDB. And they really found that having to put multiple different databases, each catering to a specific type of microservice made it really hard for them to achieve the breakout velocity that they wanted in releasing features, right? Quickly to end users. So by moving to developer, by moving to distributed SQL, they were able to really accelerate their pace at which they were able to build applications. So what's coming next, right? We talked about some of the things that's there. What's coming next from a Yugabyte DB point of view? Well, we are committed to adding a lot more features that are Postgres compatible, such as read committed isolation level, in addition to serializable and repeatable read, well, read committed just happens to be the default isolation level in a lot of relational databases like Postgres, Oracle, et cetera. Well, a number of others like GIN and GIST, and GIST indexes and foreign tables are foreign data wrappers, right? Uh, we're also simplifying migrations to cloud native distributed SQL by building a, you know, uh, a data migration service that can help you move from existing databases like Postgres, MySQL, Oracle, et cetera, by, and doing live migrations to minimize downtime to something like Yucobyte DB. So watch out for all of this in the future. If you're interested in general to learn more about the space of application development and cloud in the cloud native world and what it takes to simplify and, and uh, you know, really give, get, accelerate building of these applications. You might wanna check out these sessions that are happening over the next couple of days. Uh, uh, Bhaskar Ghosh, the CTO at 8VC is going to be talking about uh, applications and personas in the cloud native world. Uh, Rakesh Verma is going to be talking about how do you do data modernization at scale, right? And uh, Seishu from the US Bank is going to talk about how US Bank actually scales its data platform to serve billions of customer interactions in real time. 
uh, Logan from General Motors is going to be talking about the journey of how GM is thinking of started from, you know, back in the, the back in 72, the first set of vehicles that, you know, they were building and uh, the world was utilizing it to connected vehicles and ultra crews and what the future of, you know, the vehicle industry looks like. Right. And uh, Sriram from Kroger is going to talk about how uh, Kroger is really, um, you know, powering its digital growth and uh, how they're thinking about themselves as a tech first, data first company. Uh, Nathan from Liquibase is going to talk about how, you know, how to make database changes easy in the cloud native world where you have to keep building applications. And Raj Kumar from Blitz is going to be talking about um, how do you do continuous data replication with a to a distributed database, right? So all fascinating sessions, a lot more out there. Do check it out. Okay, the second any is any scale, right? So the first thing to realize is every developer wants their apps to take off. We talked about that in the previous section, but what does success really look like for an app, right? The minute an app achieves success is when it becomes really popular and a ton of people start using it. So you can think of what happens with say an amazon.com or any of the retailers during Black Friday that have a great online experience as an example. You can think of the Super Bowl event and the number of commercials that go through as another example. Uh, you can think of, you know, the, the Christmas and the shopping around the Christmas event. Well, you can think of pretty much anything else that makes an app go viral, right? But what's the commonality here? Tons of people start using it and you have need for instantaneous scale, right? So success requires you to scale immediately, right? Unfortunately, if your scaling is not that easy unless you're prepared for it ahead of time, so if you're not ready to scale, you're only going to be successful to be beaten by the success, right? Which nobody really wants, whether in life or in applications. So this is what happens if you're caught unawares, right? Like you will have, you know, your website starting to get slow. People would be like the dude out there saying, you know what, that's not really the experience I want. And they'll start switching to other um, equivalent services and the success that came will as quickly get eroded away, right? So. What is needed in order to achieve this, right? Like the basic ask is on-demand scalability, right? Like, is that too much to ask? Well, what is the ask really? The first thing is you should be able to scale out when you need to. It's, it's not practical to start with an oversized system because it costs too much even ahead of knowing if your app is going to be successful. So when you hit success, you should immediately be able to scale out pretty seamlessly, pretty painlessly, and without having to take the application down and re-architect it. And sometimes, you know, the spikes are seasonal. So in the case of like, say a Black Friday or a Cyber Monday, you want to scale back down after the peak load has, has, has gone by, right? So you want to be thinking about, you know, how easy is it to scale back down? The third thing is there are a number of systems like vertical scaling systems that would scale up, but only to a certain point after which you wouldn't be able to scale up any further, right? So now if you have peaks that go beyond what your current system can do, you pretty much have to start from scratch and think about what to do, right? So those are really the things to, to think about. And you know, a lot of folks that I hear will say, do you really need that much scale? Like, like you're perfectly fine just scaling up and just holding tight if you design your application right. Well, here are some real workloads and real numbers from, that we see in our workloads on distributed SQL. Well, our largest workload now is actually just breaking over a million transactions a second. Yes, you heard that right. It does more than a million operations a second on the database tier. We see that workloads frequently hit over 300,000 transactions a second. Um, our largest data set size is 100 terabytes of data and growing fast, right? And five terabytes is actually no longer large, right? at least even in the transactional world. A lot of folks, a lot of applications tend to approach that number. And we have clusters that are over 2000 vCPUs in just one cluster, right? And 200 vCPU deployments are quite common. If you remember in the previous slide, we talked about 96 cores being the limit, right? So it's gonna be difficult to accommodate these type of applications in, you know, in, in, in those environments which give you a limited amount of scale. And you're constantly as a developer is going for success, going to worry about what happens if you hit some of these limits because that really is going to be a showstopper for you at that point. Now, in terms of scale, here's some of the exciting work that you know, we've been doing at, on Yugabyte DB. 
which now it, is able to comfortably handle 100,000 warehouses in TPCC. So if you think of TPCC as a complex relational application, well, you see the TPCC application does about 99, is about 99, runs it with about 99% efficiency, has about a 70 second, uh, millisecond, 70 millisecond average transaction latency. A transaction is a, a app transaction, which consists of multiple different operations here. And it can seamlessly, it delivers seamless performance and scale. So if you want more performance and you want to handle a larger data set, you simply add more nodes and you get it on the fly, right? And, and you can look at the, the graphs on the right, and it shows you of actually the running cluster. Uh, the database is doing over 600,000 operations per second or, or like we, as a part of the user transactions with over 33 terabytes of data in the cluster. It was um, slightly over 3,000 vCPUs in the entire cluster and each operation is under 10 milliseconds, right? So if you think about it, this is an example of a massive workload that we're able to achieve. Again, there's a session talking about the details here. Do go attend and take a look at that one if you're interested in the details. Um, the thing, uh, so we thought we'd put in a user story here. Uh, the user story here is uh, Travis Logan, the CTO of uh, Just to Know, uh, like moved from uh, like his existing SQL Server deployment to distributed SQL, uh, specifically Yugabyte DB, because it was easy to move, right? And he was able to migrate from SQL Server uh, in order to, he needed to migrate from SQL Server in order to achieve scalability, right? And uh, that was difficult to do with his existing system. So I will let Travis speak in his own words and, you know, enjoy. You can tell Yugabyte and their team really stand behind their product. They're making updates all the time. Definitely the best support I've ever gotten from a database team. My name's Travis Logan, and I am the CTO and co-founder of Just Do Know. We've evolved into a complete on-site conversion optimization platform. Moving to our current database powered by Yugabyte DB, um, it was able to consolidate all of these into one managed cluster, which also ends up meaning far less overhead from a personnel standpoint. So the DevOps requirements just went from huge to almost nothing and costs go down, manageability go down or easier. As we increase the load test, we watch the different resource usage on the Yugabyte cluster go up and then we would add a, a set of nodes to the Yugabyte cluster and watch that resource usage on average across the nodes go back down. From a platform standpoint, the management of it, I don't think there's another data place platform on the market that allows you to centrally manage it in the sense where you can add and remove nodes. And then also another big factor was working with Yugabyte. So their team was amazing to work with. They were very quick, very helpful. All the things you're looking for, they kind of were at the top of their game. It's been a very successful partnership. Okay, if that sounded interesting, what Travis had to say and the way uh, Yugabyte DB and distributed SQL is able to scale, you might find these other sessions also very interesting. Uh, the, the first one about uh, US Bank scaling its data by Seishu. Uh, the second one about how, uh, you know, the path to 100,000 warehouses on TPCC by Sonal and Heyman from Yugabyte. Uh, the third one about performance tuning and best practices for with TPCC by Sonal and Derek. And, uh, and last but not the least, yet another RDBMS at Turkey's largest e-commerce platform, Trendyol by Hussein. Okay, with that, let's go to the third any, uh, any time, right? Well, they do say time is money. Well, you know, in the, in the world of services and applications, you can say uptime is money or uptime is even more money. Now that means you really have to protect the uptime of the application, but how do you protect your database specifically? Well, your app is, is stateless and can be quickly brought up elsewhere, but your database has state, right? So how do you protect your database from unforeseen failures in the cloud, right? You could have, I mean, what you would call a force majeure or a, an act of God, right? Like some, some kind of a, a storm or an earthquake or any of these unforeseen things that happen, right? Well, you might say, does that really happen? Well, it turns out it actually does. So not, not too long ago, pretty recently actually, 
The OVH cloud was in the news because the building that hosted all the servers caught fire, causing downtime. Well, if, my, if you think that's an isolated incident, well, there was severe weather that took down Microsoft's Azure cloud services in Texas. So the US central region had experienced difficulty. AWS Tokyo region had an outage, taking banks and share traders, a bunch of stuff down, having a big impact, right? So these things do happen. These things will continue to happen and failures have to be baked into the cloud native equation, right? So how do you really get to any time, always up, right? Well, if you really look into and peer into what causes downtime, well, there's a few things. Firstly, maintenance operations such as software upgrades, security patching, changing your machine type, all of them lead to downtime. Your node outages also lead to downtime. A node simply fails without any reason. And thirdly, things like zone and region outages cause extended downtime. Now, if you look at the distributed SQL world versus your existing uh, traditional RDBMS world, well, you people on the traditional side with the RDBMS side would say, you know what, you could always promote a replica. You have a replica. And the minute you promote it to a primary, your, your application is good to go. Well, the application really becomes complex for two reasons, right? Firstly, the promotion is typically a manual event. Like you want to make sure you haven't lost too much data when you're doing the promotion. And secondly, there is potential for data loss, right? So your application becomes complex because it really needs to understand what happens if a little bit of data didn't make it across. And is that going to cause an inconsistent behavior for the end user and how to give the end user a better experience and so on and so forth, right? With distributed SQL, you can automate the day two operations like software upgrades and patching and you know, et cetera. You can do changing, uh, change machine types or even survive failures with like pretty much no manual effort. You can like make it completely automated. And so your application and your operations become simple. You're able to bring down your RTO, your time to uh, recover into as little as three seconds and with virtually no data loss, right? So that makes everything much simple, truly getting you to uh, uh, you know, a zero downtime uh, like deployment or any time available for the end user. Now, this is an example, is a real world example of a retailer and how they weathered the Texas um, storm that took down the, the data center in Dallas. Right, so um, they had like you go by DB deployed across regions in a multi-region deployment, as uh, and you know they were storing millions of items and billions of mappings across items in their product catalog, and serving hundreds of thousands of transactions per second, and you know they were able to handle the Black Friday and Cyber Monday peaks, and even when an entire data center went down, their service was resilient and available and as transactional and consistent as before, and they were able to handle the entire performance and everything without a blip, right? Uh, even though the data center went down. So it is important, and, and this is a pretty decently large size deployment. It was a 27 node cluster across the three regions, right? So nine nodes in each of the regions, and you had an entire nine nodes go down in one of the data centers. Another example of an outage that uh, Yugabyte was involved in with, along with another um, user, a customer using distributed SQL, um, is an example of how and how the outage played out in the real world for Plume. Plume um, is like an uh, uh, Plume is an embedded device, right? That enables ISPs to offer smart home and related services to their customers. And the customers of Plume are companies such as Comcast, Sky UK, and Bell Canada, some of the biggest ISPs in the world, right? The Plume device is actually embedded inside, like you know, the Comcast device and it keeps track of the quality of Wi-Fi and the security of Wi-Fi, et cetera, at various homes. Our homes are now smart enough and becoming data centers of their own, right? So the Plume device really helps make the, our data center, the home that is a data center function smoothly, right? And a little bit of uh, information about how Plume, the, the Plume application used the database. Um, it used uh, multiple Yugabyte DB clusters comprising about 60 nodes. And it was deployed in a multi-AZ and a multi-multi-zone and a multi-region deployment, and uh, you know using VPC peering and inside the VPCs and so on. Right. So here's how the actual outage played out in the real world. 
Well, about uh, 12 or 7 a.m., you know, you know, all of these issues invariably just happen past midnight because, you know, it just makes it a lot more memorable that way. Because, uh, you know, who remembers an outage that happened during office hours, right? So anyways, at 12 or 7 a.m., uh, you know, the, that's when the first time, like even though the outage had been uh, happened for just a few minutes ago and the Plume's operational team was already aware of the outage, uh, the Yugabyte platform, which ran the Yugabyte DB distributed SQL database, alerted the team to the fact that, you know, there were some checks that was failing and so on and so forth, right? And, uh, you know, everybody took a look and figured out that there were a lot of machines that had failed over, right? So um, about 12.16 a.m., right? It's about 30 minutes after the first set of alerts had fired and, you know, something was going, and people, you know, folks realized something was going wrong with the database. Uh, with, the, with the overall application, they figured something was not okay. Uh, we, the AWS status page was finally updated to reflect the outage, right? As you can see, it said that, you know, there's experiencing some issue with the service availability. Now, you know, most of the tech companies, the clouds, et cetera, it takes time to establish, to investigate, to troubleshoot, and to figure out if an outage indeed had occurred and to inform people because you don't want to be informing people in, in you know, too quickly and it'd be a false, false alarm, right? So it is, we should allow for people to, it, it, people will take a lot longer in order to figure out these things and put it out as compared to um, software. Now, software is something we expect to work much quicker. So about uh, 1.04 a.m., the, the Yugabyte support team got on a call with Plume, and we were able to review the status of their clusters. And the first thing we were able to confirm is that multiple clusters had simultaneously lost nodes present in, in the zone that was affected as you know, the, the thing that AWS confirmed was an outage. And uh, you know, the, these were multi-zone deployments. So the database itself was healthy and continuing to serve reads and writes with the consistency that they expect, even though an entire zone was out. And note that Plume was using Yugabyte DB to serve billions of operations per day, right? So they're, they were, uh, they're quite a high volume user of Yugabyte DB. Um, and even though most of the nodes by this time had recovered, uh, the EBS service was still down, right? So no good plot is without a twist. So the EBS being down, uh, which AWS confirmed about an hour later around 2.15 a.m. meant that some of the serves, some of the clusters were able to recover, those that had the local instance disks attached to them, and other clusters were not able to recover, those that had EBS disks attached to them, right? So obviously, even in the middle of all this, right, if you're, if you're not thinking about this, uh, as you're going through this outage, just think about the way it would have happened with a traditional RDBMS, right? At this point, people will be agonizing over whether it's a bug or whether something else happened. Well, here, the, the Plume folks and the Yugabyte folks had the luxury of, you know, being assured that the applications were running fine, and then they could get down to, hey, why is it that some clusters are recovering, whereas some other clusters are still continuing to alert that something is wrong, right? And then able to work backward and find out that all the clusters with local disks are able to succeed um, and those with EBS didn't even almost an hour ahead of AWS confirming because as we said, people take longer to you know, uh, detect issues and confirm them compared to software. Now about 2.30 a.m., uh, the issue with the EBS volume seemed to have been fixed right on the AWS side. However, not all instances were able to recover, AWS instances were able to recover fully, right? So most of the instances recovered but the unhealthy instances were automatically flagged by the platform, right? And, um, and again, the, the detail here was that one of the nodes with the EBS disk had fully recovered, but the disk itself was not mounted to the node, right? Which had to be done manually because that node was throwing an alert that it couldn't find a disk to write to. And uh, another node, even though was looking perfectly healthy on the AWS console, was one that nobody could SSH into or connect to using the network, right? So that meant that this node had to be manually decommissioned, removed, and replaced, right? Now, both of these operations, mounting the disk manually, as well as uh, replacing the, the bad node, both required manual fixes. So we did talk about automation, but you know, automation has its limits. And beyond a certain point, there is a requirement for some manual intervention. 
but it is very critical, it's very important to ensure that this intervention is not in the critical path of uptime, right? So the mantra behind any time is that, you know, the service is able to always serve data while the, you know, user fixes and the manual fixes can come in the background at any point, right? And this is uh, actually something that most of the large tech companies such as uh, Google and Facebook do. And, you know, myself included, a lot of folks in the Yugabyte team from Facebook had operated this way in the past. Okay, so at about 3.23 a.m., so again, notice that about midnight is when this whole thing started and about 3.23, about three and a half hours later, everything was resolved. Uh, the Plume services and the entire fleet were running fine. The Yugabyte database was confirmed to be running smoothly and uh, the entire fix was concluded. All of the issues, including writing the summary was done while, you know, just, you know, because the apps were running fine, it just gives everybody that much peace of mind when there's no pressure of bringing back services up because the application is, is not done. Well, the bottom line is that no data was lost in the incident, thanks to distributed SQL's architecture. And the database tier was running and available to perform reads and writes the entire time, including when the AZ outage happened, right? So, um, so again, it's important to, to think about how we can get to a scenario where even if there is a real outage and outages are, are failures are the norm, right? Failures are a part of the equation in cloud native applications. It's very important for us to think through the architecture because in a number of these scenarios, software often does this job or software and architecture does the job a lot better than humans can. And, and that's the right thing to use it for. If you're interested in these type of uh, uh, high availability resilience and any time type of uh, stories, check out the following sessions coming up over the next couple of days. Uh, the first one, which is about running Yugabyte DB at a fraction of the cost with spot instances. And you know, spot instances, as you know, can be yanked at any time. So it's something that you have to be sure you have enough replication for in order to survive. So using resilience to actually reduce cost is something Leon from Cast AI is going to talk about. Um, and there's architecting resilient geo-distributed stateful apps on VMware Tanzu, which is a Kubernetes platform by Vinay from VMware and Amay from Yugabyte. Um, cloud native disaster recovery with Yugabyte DB in OpenShift um, is something that Rafael is going to be talking about from Red Hat, where he sets up uh, an OpenShift cluster and deploys Yugabyte DB on it and looks at what happens if there is a real disaster and how does it behave and, and so on and so forth. There's a, a demo, a live demo of cloud native resilience with Yugabyte platform and the YSQL smart driver. Uh, the YSQL smart driver, by the way, is something that's unique to Yugabyte DB where we're trying to push the limits on simplifying cloud native applications by making the Postgres SQL driver aware of a cluster. So it can connect to a single node and discover all the nodes in the cluster. And you don't really need a load balancer and it really understands the layout of the cluster underneath, right? So Ame and Jake from Yugabyte are going to be talking about that. And last but not the least, getting started with Spring Data Yugabyte DB by Nikhil from Yugabyte. All right, the fourth any is anywhere, right? Anywhere, meaning move your data anywhere you want it or distribute your data across geographies. Okay, geodistribution. Why do you even want to do it in the first place? Well, there's three primary reasons, as you can see. The first one being resilience. We just talked about how to survive failures. Well, in the example of the big retailer that survived the entire um, data center outage, well, they couldn't really have done that if they didn't distribute their data across different geographies. So, you know, the first one is to be able to survive anything, right? The second reason is to move data closer to your end users and customers so that they get low latency access to data and they are really wowed by your service. The third reason is, you know, the world is increasing, world of data is increasingly becoming a complex place where there's a number of compliance and regulatory requirements. Like you have to keep data for a variety of different applications local um, specifically if they're PII or personal data in different parts of the world, right? So the, the users of that from those parts of the world, their data has to be kept local to those geographies. And even though your app is the same app, it requires different pieces of data living in different geographies, making it geodistributed. Okay, so what do you really do with geodistribution? How do you really achieve geodistribution? Well, you really have to look for the different types of features you need from the underlying substrate, the data layer. 
um, such as multi-zone and multi-zone and multi-region synchronous uh, replication, replicated clusters. And then you have asynchronous replication, be it bidirectional or unidirectional, and geopartitioning. And each one helps a different subset of the features we talked about in terms of geo distribution, right? So multi zone, multi region gives you resilience. Async replication gives you resilience, but and performance obviously trades off uh, transactionality a bit. And geopartitioning gives you performance and compliance, right? And, and it'll actually segment your data and place it in different uh, parts of the world. And you know, the, the real kicker here is that a single application often requires more, more, one or more of resilience, performance, and compliance, right? And, and maybe an example would make it clear. Um, if, you, if you look at, uh, like, uh, in the words of James Hartig, the co-founder of Admiral, right? Admiral is a very interesting platform, an interesting company that's building a multi-region application, which is pretty cutting edge and a global application. And they're trying to achieve the perfect balance between availability, resilience, and performance, right? So this is an example of how resilience and performance become important. And, uh, you know, I'll let James tell the story in his own words. Working with the Yugabyte team has been a breeze to say the least. They've been instrumental in helping us with migrations of existing workloads to Yugabyte DB. They've also helped us with schema design and application design. Hi, my name is James Hardig, and I'm a co-founder at Admiral. Being a founder, I wear many hats but I spend most of my time working on the backend and the infrastructure. Yugabyte DB has a faster and more capable product than we've previously experienced with other databases. Their team is extremely knowledgeable and their commitment to their product is outstanding. Admiral is looking for a fast and horizontally scalable database that will not only perform well on our workloads today, but allow us to grow and utilize more complex workloads in the future. So we currently self-host Yugabyte DB on Google Cloud with three Yugabyte nodes per region across five regions across three continents. But this month, we're actually rolling out an even larger cluster using Yugabyte Cloud. Yugabyte DB has far exceeded our expectations and original goals on our project. Once you get the Yugabyte cluster set up, it's hands off from there. You can easily add more capacity or remove capacity with a simple click of a button or spinning up or spinning down extra nodes. Despite the dramatic 2020 election season, we did not see any hiccups and were able to easily scale our Yugabyte DB deployment without any decrease in availability or increase in latency. We are currently doing over 7,000 operations per second and 90% of those queries finish in less than five milliseconds. We've been extremely happy with their performance as a team and we're looking forward to continuing with the relationship going forward. Choosing Yugabyte DB was one of the best decisions our team has ever made and I only wish we had made it sooner. Okay, to recap, uh, you know, the Admiral architecture um, and the reason why they're doing whatever it is they're doing with distributed SQL is to make sure their application never goes down while being able to achieve a five millisecond global latency while serving their users at scale, right? So in terms of resilience, they want, they're doing synchronous replication across three different regions in the US, West, Central, and East, so that it can survive the failure of any one region. And in terms of performance, they are reading from replicas in Asia and Europe so that they can still serve data with a really low latency, right? So that's a perfect trade-off of, uh, of doing asynchronous reads and synchronous replication across regions for the various reasons. All right, so in this bucket, there's some other great talks coming up over the next couple of days again. Uh, check out Geo Distribution, Geo Geo Distributing for Resilience, Performance and Compliance by our very own Taylor from Yugabyte. Um, getting started with Spring Data Yugabyte by Nikhil. Uh, Yugabyte Cloud, the quickest way to getting started with Yugabyte DB by uh, Sudha and Chirag. And uh, last but not the least, uh, Yugabyte DB in multi-region Anthos environments by Jake and Amay from Yugabyte. All right, let's talk about the next any, the fifth any, any cloud, right? If you notice, we're starting from really simple concerns and going to more and more advanced concerns, right? Just like multi-region and anywhere is a, is a relatively cutting edge modern concept, so is any cloud, right? So in like, what does any cloud mean? Well, there's a number of applications we all know that need to run in different clouds. There could be like, you know, users and uh, enterprises that need to run different applications in different clouds, but there are actual applications that need to be deployed, like actual single applications that need to be deployed in a variety of different clouds and locations, right? 
And these are an emerging set of applications that are super interesting and are really revolutionizing our lives and the way we live, right? And we're just calling these edge applications, which are an emerging set, right? And they cut across all verticals, right? As an example, you just think about the retail experience, right? Today with, uh, you know, after COVID, especially, all of the buying pattern has shifted to heavily online, but people still go to stores. So that means that the retail experience has multiple different retail stores in different geographies and a central e-commerce app. And you know, folks can order through the e-commerce app and then do curbside pickup. Uh, in, in a particular store, folks may want to check availability of what's present and not present in a particular store before visiting it and so on and so forth, right? Similarly, the connected vehicles where, you know, the vehicles are getting smarter and smarter and trying to, you know, do navigation and tell us about, you know, our driving pattern to make sure we get good discount from insurance providers or tell us when they, you know, you, you don't have enough gas in the car in order to make it to a certain destination and so on. 5G as a, you know, as a new, is bringing a whole new set of innovation and revolution to a number of different applications. And there's, a, there's any number of examples of this, right? Even the, the very Zoom meetings we're talking about here are another uh, revolution, right? Where you're able to create meetings and join them from different parts of the world. And so the data is necessarily distributed, right? Distributed first. And in all of these applications, the theme that we're seeing is that, you know, users and, and the community and, and, you know, enterprises are starting to look for more interesting distribution, distribution options from the database to simplify the application. Right. Um, so, you know, if you're looking at um, Yugabyte, the edge applications running along with Yugabyte DB, well, the edge application and the database will form a stack and they will have to be deployed across the world in a variety of different, you know, um, substrates, right? These could be bare metal, ranging all the way from bare metal to VMs to uh, a variety of different public clouds, et cetera. And uh, they could, and they typically deploy it inside Kubernetes as a common substrate so that it's really cloud agnostic and it can run wherever it's deployed and it's easy to manage and so on and so forth, right? So even if you look at Kubernetes, there are a variety, a plethora of managed Kubernetes deployments along with raw Kubernetes that anybody can manage by themselves. And the whole thing needs to get shipped all over the place, right? So that's, that's really what we're talking about. And, um, you know, as an example, uh, let me, I mean, it's, it's good to hear from Nial, the co-founder of cplane.io on what it takes to build edge applications and, you know, why does it really require a distributed SQL database? So I'll let Nial explain in his own words. My name is Niall Dalton and I'm the co-founder of cplane.io. Great. So the essence of edge computing is bringing apps and data to where the global audience uh, needs them and where, whenever, wherever that is. Yugabyte's a truly distributed database lets us bring SQL to the edge. So together we're unlocking the planet for delivery of full stack applications and microservices everywhere. Uh, with, you know, without Yugabyte, we couldn't deliver the database UX uh, our users want with the resilience, performance, and scalability that they really need. Okay, so that was a great explanation by Nial. Now, a lot of you may be thinking, if I deploy in, you know, uh, in a different types of clouds and different types of substrates and I start replicating data all over the place, does any cloud actually end up incurring a performance hit? Am I going to be so slow in my performance and so high in the latency and, and so on that this is going to become untenable to build an app, right? So there's a great um, piece of work done by folks um, at Cast AI, um, again, as a part of the Yugabyte uh, community, where they did this work of running the TPCC benchmark on two different clusters, both Kubernetes, and one running only on the, on the Google Cloud using GKE, and the second running across two clouds, AWS and GCP, using the cast.ai solution. In both cases, they're, three, they're deployed across three zones, right? So in one case, three zones in uh, Google Cloud alone, and in the second case, three zones across AWS and GCP in the same region, right? And they were able to show that the TPMC results, the efficiency and the latency, they were pretty close in both cases, right? Which is really amazing to see that you're able to get very similar performance characteristics, even if you're deploying across clouds. And with Kubernetes, it really makes it, you know, abstracted away the infrastructure, right? So that makes it, you know, really exciting for these edge applications. Okay, so we have a set of announcements of our own in this bucket as well. And we want to make any look effortless, right? Like especially any cloud. 
So, you know, we, with, without further ado, very proud to announce that, you know, we're announcing the general availability of Yugabyte Cloud. Um, and, you know, uh, Yugabyte DB, as you know, is completely open source. It's fully compatible with PostgreSQL and gives you resilient scale and geographic distribution. But now you can consume it as a fully managed service, you know, where you're, you, know, you don't have to worry about the database at all. We'll take care of the operations. We'll take care of uh, everything that needs to go into running the database. And it is secure by design. It's got enterprise SLAs. And you know, we take care of global and multi-cloud deployment as well. So in a nutshell, you, know, you bring your apps and we'll take care of your database. I'll, as a one of our, one of the very early adopters of Yugo by Cloud was uh, uh, Philip from Abra Controls, um, and they have a very interesting story on what about and this very interesting space and what they do a very interesting application. And uh, I'll let Philip say in his own words what he found interesting about Yugo by Cloud and why he ended up going with uh, Yugo by DB and and uh, his journey. One obvious thing that Yugo by DB allows us to do is to focus on our application rather than worrying about configuring and maintaining the DevOps of a database. For us, it's really been about the peace of mind so far. My name is Bill Plarachal, currently the application architect at Abra Controls. Abra Controls has historically provided offset well monitoring services for our clients. The reason that we started researching a new database was really that we were hoping to get something with a little bit of a better guarantee for high availability. This aspect of our database is like extremely important. In my experience, Yugabyte has been extremely resilient to the workloads we've been throwing at it. It's handling our production grade data stream without any issue. We ultimately decided to use Yugabyte DB because it provides both really great high availability, it provides transactions in a scalable way, and it does all of that with a really familiar syntax via its Postgres compatible query language and also its Cassandra compatible query language. And for us, that was really, really great. We chose Yugabyte Cloud for this particular scenario because it's extremely important for us that it's always up all the time. We can lean on Yugabyte to help us out with that kind of thing. And that's really important for our clients. And so it's really important for us. OK, so if you are interested, as uh, like Philip, if you are interested in trying out your application and see uh, and getting a taste for Yugabyte Cloud, well, uh, look no further. You can just get started for free. Uh, we have a perpetual, perpetually free free tier, and it's uh, recommended for non-production uh, workloads, but it really will get you running with your apps, right? And uh, you, we also have a pay-as-you-go tier, which is uh, billed minutely at 0.4 cents uh, per minute, right? So it really uh, it comes to about 25 cents an hour or so. Right. So um, again, we're very excited and very proud to announce this. Do check it out. Um, and as a special offer, you know, it really pays to stay till the end of the keynote. So as a special offer for all of, the, all of you folks here, we're, we're giving you a $6,000 qualifying credit. Um, so use the promo code DSS21 when you sign up and uh, uh, drop by and say hi to us in our community Slack. If you have any questions, do reach out to us. Okay, so if you're interested in any cloud, well, these are some great sessions to attend. Uh, you'd probably, you probably wanna check out Workload Isolation in a Multi-Tenant Container-Based Architecture by Radek uh, from Clario, and Data on Kubernetes, Yes We Can, by uh, Bart uh, from the Data on Kubernetes community, the DOK community, uh, and Yugobyte uh, Cloud Effortless Distributed SQL by Chirag and Suda from Yugobyte. Uh, and a demo of running an actual uh, Anthos, an actual uh, multi-region deployment on Anthos and you know, running an application on, on it and, and demoing failures and so on by Jake and Ame. And last but not the least, deploying a Spring Boot app on Kubernetes and Yugabyte Cloud by Marco and Srinivasa from Yugabyte. With that, I'd like to thank all of you folks for attending the keynote. And uh, this is gonna be a great conference. We have a ton of folks uh, attending the conference. Our uh, number of uh, you know, users joining us for the conference has been a record high. Each year is higher than the previous and this year is no exception. Uh, do enjoy. And uh, this conference is meant to be fun as well. So you know, there's gonna be a lot of you know, 
banter going on, do join in and uh, you know, welcome to the party. <laughs>